both of you, uh, since we haven't had the opportunity of working together since 9-11. Uh, and it just shows you how good colleagues come back together. So thank you, Jim, for this uh, invite and this opportunity and, and to see that you're well and, and uh, doing great things still in New York. So um, with that said, uh, I wanted to share with you um, our network really just began right after 9-11. Uh, we actually kicked off on October 1 of 2001. And at that point, we were only 17 centers, and now we are 116 centers across the country. And our mission is to raise the standard and quality of care for all types of uh, children who have been and families who have been impacted by trauma, whether it's something like 9-11, uh, uh, Superstorm San Sandy, Sandy Hook, or um, after the latest uh, at the public health emergency like COVID-19. And you'll see some of the representation of our network. Um, and we uh, deal with all types of traumas, whether it's domestic violence, uh, child abuse, uh, trafficking. Um, I head up our terrorism and disaster program. So that's usually those things that hit national news. And why our network is so important right now is that COVID um, and this pandemic isn't impacting kids all the same way. And we do need to be thinking about what are some of those considerations, whether it's the ethnic, uh, racial, cultural. Um, we've been highlighting the dispar health disparities, um, comorbidities, uh, social economic issues, including that this pandemic can be a reminder for other traumas that these our kids have experienced. So it's important for us to think about what are these elements that might put some of our kids more at risk and how are our service systems that uh, impact, um, uh, how do we support each other and how are these service systems actually being impacted? And how, um, as you can see, we need to think about our military vets to our child welfare and juvenile justice residential systems, to our school systems and our health mental health, and how do they work together as we think about what are those things that can help meet the needs of our um, those that have been impacted um, by this pandemic. And so one of the things um, when we talk about psychological first aid, um, I try to step back for a minute and no matter what lens you're coming into, we need to be thinking about what are five principles that to keep in mind as a clinician, as a uh, practitioner of how any type of emergency, especially the uh, COVID-19 might be impacting our communities. So the first one is safety. And so what are those safety intervention strategies that I need to be thoughtful about? Uh, and that's why early on it was important to talk about um, uh, healthy protective uh, uh, behaviors that we had to do, thinking about how is uh, exposure happening? What are those ways to get trusted information? Um, but as we've gone through this for a couple of months, it's also been important, what other adversities are some of our community members experiencing and how that might adversely impact them more than some other community members. And that includes the economic hardships, the health disparities. Uh, we know when there's ongoing stresses and impacts, there can be increases of other types of abuse, such as child abuse or domestic violence. Um, We've had clear uh, indications of, of racism or other stigmas against some of our, um, our essential workers and the concerns about increases of suicides. And so we want to think about what are those strategies to mitigate these safety issues as well as providing a support to our um, community members. Um, and the other safety issue is that um, there's been a lot of data, including after 9-11, that too much media viewing or even social media viewing can actually increase distress. And we need to think about, is that happening for our community members um, and ways to, that people can get the information they need, but not get over, over saturated by it. So 
safety is that first, calming is that second intervention strategy. We know that these emergencies impact us in so many ways that and can cause us distress, whether that's because of anxiety, uh, because of uh, bereavement issues. Um, we've heard quite a few talk about that sleep is a problem right now and significant insomnia. So we have to think about what are those ways that we can create intervention strategies that help with calming? So that's part of the edu uh, providing broad-based education, helping with uh, coping and anxiety management techniques, and making sure that there's access when I need to get help, I have the ability to get help. And that's what we're trying to do with some of our calming strategies. The third uh, area that we think about is self and community efficacy. All of our communities have strengths, and we really have to dig into those strengths, especially in times of an uncertainty. So as we're thinking about the reopening and what is it gonna look like for our communities, we really need to bring in our community members' participation because as, the more that they're part of this decision-making, we know the more that it can actually work for their community, and we can think about who else might need support. And so we've seen so much of that through having food bank drives, um, the whole initiative of making sure that there were senior hours at grocery stores so that our seniors could actually um, get that, um, have that ability to get their groceries and have a little bit more security that they weren't being exposed all the volunteer opportunities, these are all things that show, showcase our community strengths. The fourth category, so we did um, safety, calming, efficacy, connectedness. Now connectedness, we know, is one of the most pro, uh, protective factors in helping us heal and recover from any type of, emo um, of emergency. But what I would say with this is that I've actually expanded my vocabulary and made us think about healthy connections. Because as we go farther away from the initial emergency, our connections might not be as healthy as they were in the beginning. So we've heard from family members that, hey, it was great to be together and have this family meal time. And now we're, now we're just need time away. So is those, health, is those relationships starting to fray? Are they starting to get to a place that, um, that they are no longer um, healthy and potentially could become abusive? So we're wanting to tap into how do we make sure we get these connections healthy again? Are we actually thinking about engagement? How, it's one thing to be on a Zoom call, for example. There's another that if I'm never engaging on these in Zoom calls, am I really getting the benefits or others getting the benefits from me that we need to? And as Christina and I talked about, you know, we have to definitely have in mind that there are some extra extroverts out there as well as introverts. So we don't want to turn those introverts into something that they don't want to be. But we do need to think about who are those that are, are withdrawing that this is a new, uh, a new situation for them? Are they not able to get those connections that they really do need to, to, um, to get those supports? And how do we make sure that they're getting those connections? And that final piece of this is hope. How do we think about um, that part, some of this is temporary? Do I know what temporary means right now? Not necessarily, as we're concerned about a second wave. But there have been times that we've been through other pandemics or other emergencies, 9-11, uh, Superstorm Standy. There's so many examples of how New York has pulled through um, in times of distress. Are we highlighting how you guys have rebounded or adjusted during these hard times? What has worked for you? And could they apply for this situation? Um, there's ways to show hope and ways that we, uh, to show that we can get through this. Simple things like gratitude or positive affirmations that I know this is tough, but look how great you're doing. Or I really appreciate how much you're supporting your staff um, and 
making sure that you're still connected. Making sure that people can still hold on to those um, elements for the future and that maybe their ways that they can get their goal met might be needed to be adjusted a little while, but we shouldn't um, throw away all of our future aspirations and helping people to hold on to those things are important during this time. So when we're thinking about providing behavioral health support right now, we're looking at really the three tiers of support. That tier one is that broad education. It was some of those elements I was just talking about. It's making sure that we have hotlines for attending to people's basic needs. It's what we're gonna focus on today with psychological first aid. Tier two are those that are having a little bit more distress or feeling stuck right now in their functioning. And you're gonna hear that there, one aspect might be something like a skills building intervention or a peer support group, um, skills for psychological recovery, which we'll touch on a little bit later if it's that tier two. But we do know that some in our communities will need psychiatric services or more intensive trauma grief treatments. And those are absolutely available in New York. And there's some really great um, providers that do this work. And we need to educate people that if they have um, these treatments do work and they do help people to recover. So um, let me turn it over to Christina to share um, uh, just in a second about psychological first aid. but. Um, as a uh, transparency, the NC, uh, PTSD NCTSN version, I am one of the authors of it. Um, if you're wanting any of the manuals, we actually have, you'll see on here that all of their translations, including we have ones for school, we have uh, clergy, we also have ones for some of our victim services um, and uh, for our homeless shoot Take a look at some of these PFA guides. We also have a free six hour course. If you're wanting free CEs, go to, or even CMEs, uh, take, go to learn.nctsn.org. And we also have a mobile app that you might be interested in. So what basically, what is PFA? It's, uh, it fits into eight core actions. Um, that um, not everyone goes through those actions, but we need to be thinking about what are those ways of making those connections? How do we help people with um, safety concerns, but giving those comforts and they might have experienced a bereavement or some other type of um, hardship. There are so many that are worried about their family members being sick. They might um, have had developmental disruptions going on. Um, some might need some basic stabilization because things are just so overwhelming. But we always think about, um, we have to fit people where we're, they are currently at and what are their current concerns so that we can tap into their practical assistance or basic needs, help with those supports that I talked about, what coping strategies can be utilized and thinking about other types of services that might help them with their journey. Um, so, Christina, how, what else would you add to the PFA kind of thoughts here? In terms of other core actions, I think the flexibility of the model is something that I've, I've um, always brought with me as a PFA provider, as well as a, as a clinician. Um, and as we think about providing PFA during COVID, um, we are definitely kind of in the same storm together, but we're on different boats. And as Melissa discussed, we are looking at lots of different overlap of various challenges and adversities that our clients are facing. And assisting first and foremost with meeting the basic needs for our clients, you know, attending to food, clothing, and shelter, um, especially safety for many of our clients who may need access to food now that people are at work or even isolated um, with transportation, especially in New York having been shut down for so long, just making sure that we are attending to some of these basic needs. Um, and as we think about this time, um, as Melissa said, you know, in responding to other disasters, so much of responding to COVID is stay, sitting with and dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity. 
And those feelings of not really knowing when it's over, um, we don't have the sense of something ending and us doing a response. So in some ways it's as if we're changing the car tire as the car is still in motion. You know, we're kind of moving and creating and recognizing that we're all in this together and we're responding in, in the ways we can. Um, in my clinical work with our communities, um, I think one of the things that has become very apparent is that everyone is coping differently and their needs may vary day to day, um, even hour to hour. Um, and I think that first and foremost, listening and validating feelings as people are experiencing them. Um, sometimes just that reflection, that reflective listening of helping a client recognize what feeling state they're in, that gaining awareness helps them actually recognize how to manage it. Um, especially now, there's so much uncertainty. I, I have worked with um, a family where the mother of the young child I've been seeing um, experienced in the course of the week the death of her grandmother and the death of her grandfather. And it was in early April when so much our, our crisis in terms of New York and hospital systems was really reaching its, its peak. And once their loved ones entered the hospital setting, they had no information coming in. Um, they couldn't talk with their loved ones. And so much what was happening is there was a lack of information and there was so much uncertainty. And that when their loved number, when their loved ones passed away, they were not notified of death until 24 hours post postmortem, and they were not able to have their loved ones' bodies released to them until 48 hours um, later. And when we think about our, our processes of, of grieving and ceremonies around uh, burial, all of these avenues of coping have also been considerably affected by the virus. In this family situation, they're a Christian um, and Hindu family, and their ritual around death was, was curtailed. Um, family members couldn't participate, and there was a lot of lack of social connection, which is normally would have been very coping and very calming for that family. Um, you know, as we know, important life events and milestones are also being um, missed. You know, we have our class of 2020, our high school graduates, our college graduates, um, even preschool. My son just graduated from preschool. Um, so these important life events and these, these moments in time where we are celebrating, and we usually think about that as a coming together or a celebration, a ceremony, have also been missing. So how does that affect people and their sense of accomplishment? Um, their sense of things moving and time. Um, so we are seeing definitely an experience of a rise in guilt, of rise in anxiety, or even like this connection or sadness. So what do we do about it? How do we help to encourage the use of the strategies that CFA um, fosters to help everyone cope with these stress <clears throat> excuse me, stressful situations? Um, so calming, calming is a very important intervention and in just helping folks gain awareness of their physiological self. So when we think about how to calm the mind and body, we want to allow our clients to recognize that in a state of stress where maybe they're very activated, they're feeling very um, revved up, how we can do things like breathing. Um, bringing awareness to breath by just simply focusing on an inhale and a slow exhale. It reminds our systems, it cues our relax relaxation response on that exhale to begin to slow the heart rate down, slow the breathing rate down, really begin to become more embodied so that we can create a sense of calm when we are feeling more anxious. Strategies of mindfulness can also help people focus on the here and now. Um, I think so much of this pandemic brings us into the past where we think of how things used to be, or we bring ourselves into the future of what's going to happen next, where are we going to be, what's the second wave going to look like, when are things going to kind of resume normalcy. And we, have con we don't have control of either of those, those directions. We have the control of the here and now. Um, a strategy I like to bring to my clients is uh, a mindfulness strategy uh, that I simply call 54321, which is focusing on five things we see, 
four things we hear, three things we can touch, two things we can smell, and one thing we can taste. And so using our senses as grounding will really help us to anchor into, into the present moment. Melissa mentioned gratitude and focusing on positive. Um, I have heard so many clients, you know, talk about the things they can't do or the things they don't have access to, how everything's changed. And even just shifting that thinking to, okay, well, what do we have? What can we do? How do we think about the positive that may be existing, even in the areas of really stretching past that wall of all the camps to kind of recognizing and seeing what can what can be done, what we can see. Um, I think it's very important, again, to engage in our clients' existing strengths. Very often, our clients may be doing things that are healthy coping or calming strategies already. And one of the things that I like to, to work with is just asking clients, what are you doing now for calm? What are you doing now for relaxation. Um, and I think that uh, helping clients see the differences between healthy coping and unhealthy coping, and when we need to build a bigger toolkit where we can offer some of these other calming strategies, um, it can help them expand that. I know my toolkit, there's certain things that, you know, sitting down and doing some breathing may not be what I feel like I need to do in that moment. Maybe I need to go for a run or sit down and, and create something or spend time with my family. The mood and the situation may really need uh, and require us to do different things. So helping our clients develop variety is, is key. Uh, behavioral activation, getting ourselves moving really connects to that sense of self efficacy mentioned earlier. Uh, so even that sense of, I'm just gonna go out for a five minute walk or I'm going to put on some music and dance, or you know what, I have to clean, I have to do my, my uh, sanitizing routine, but put on some few fun music and dance while you're doing it. Um, behavioral activation is getting our body up and moving, which is going to do amazing things just for our overall endorphins and serotonin, getting our bodies moving, but also giving us something that we've done that also gives us, gives us a sense of um, I don't know, productivity it gives us a sense of what we've done um, and uh, it helps us to move in the direction of whether, rather than being sedentary. And for many of us, sitting in front of a computer is a new norm and it's really easy to sit here for a long time and not get up and move. And the thought of exercise for some of our clients can feel really daunting, but just thinking about five minutes, just thinking about getting up and moving. Um, can be key. Creating new routines. Uh, I think, as many of us know, structure and schedule is so important, especially when you're working with young children. It gives them a sense of predictability. And even for adults, knowing that you have something to look forward to within the course of the day really helps to activate you and, and keep you moving, keep you in motion. But what we're seeing is that these routines have changed. Um, Family members who once had long commutes are now maybe walking from one room to the next as a transition between work and family. Or maybe they're in a very small apartment and they're actually just a few feet away. So this concept too of, of our adults in practice actually being physically present, but perhaps not psychologically present. They may be seen, but they may not be accessible. So ways to create new routines that help kind of differentiate work from home can be very important. Um, and helping parents to young children think about structure uh, with flexibility. So I've been working with many, many children who are homeschooled by now mom, who's also maybe working full time or dad or you know multiple caregivers in a household who have all of their own um, responsibilities, and then their kid is learning Common Core math. And for all of us in New York State, we know the Common Core curriculum. If you've ever done division, you need to relearn it because you can't help your third grader with it. Um, so, so there's a lot of new software. How do we start taking breaks from that and giving parents permission? You know, if everybody's overwhelmed, take a break, go outside, get some fresh air, walk around, 
just take a mental or physical break from whatever you're doing to create that new routine. Um, and as Melissa mentioned earlier, these new um, times also have been giving us an increase in family time. So families who maybe never had meals together are now able to be together. Um, and that's a real, a real advent, advantageous opportunity. You know, but with that also can come that overwhelm of where do you need your own space? Especially for our teens who may be really feeling overwhelmed and socially disconnected from their friends. How do they kind of um, also, you know, problem solving and creativity is such an important process um, for all of us dealing dealing with the pandemic. So working with clients around problem solving, helping them create options and choices, helping them enhance their creativity to problem solve can really be um, a wonderful strategy you can do in, in working with them. And for those of you two who are working perhaps in clinics or other institutions where you're working with staff, also helping them problem solve and helping them enhance their creativity to better. Um, and social connections, in terms of being connected, um, it's about physical distancing and social connection. Um, so, like Melissa mentioned, just being on a Zoom call and maybe you're the quiet one who doesn't really say much and you've got a really loud family and everybody's talking or you have friends who are chatting. How do you create engaging or interactive time? I've had uh, clients tell me they play family bingo on Zoom or they've been doing kind of a version of win, lose, or draw remotely. And it's been a really great way to get everybody involved and everybody connected. Um, and I think for us in New York, too, we're kind of moving into different phases where we are able to be in small groups. Um, I recently had a client who had a birthday party for her six-year-old in the park, and they had hula hoops, and they put hula hoops six feet apart from one another, and all the kids sat in their hula hoops, and they did games and activities with that, with that physical distancing. Um, so we can be creative. We can use our creativity in how we, in how we do this. Um, and, you know, obviously we want to help connect uh, the people, our clients, our, our staff to resources. So we have a, a couple of resources here to offer to you guys. Um, so a few may be very familiar to you. Headspace is an awesome meditation app. Um, if you are a mental health worker, you actually can get this for free right now, which is kind of awesome. But lots of um, sessions and guided meditations. Uh, PTSD Coach has been around for a while now, but it is a wonderful psychoed tool regarding PTSD and um, clients who have had trauma or experiencing trauma now. It does help with managing triggers and managing stress related to daily life. Uh, COVID Coach has been created by the same folks, um, and this is really to help self-care and overall wellness for everyone during the pandemic. Um, so both of those apps are available and worth checking out. Um, one of my favorites is a seven minute workout. Um, I know I got out of my exercise routine very quickly at the beginning of this and the idea of starting again was daunting. But the seven minute workout is great because I feel like we all have seven minutes and it's all body weight resistance exercise you could do with a chair in your room. You don't need space, you don't need stuff. Um, so it's, it's something that is, I think, very accessible to all of us. Um, My Strength is another app that builds resiliency and, and helps to manage stress and mood and also address some of the sleep issues. Um, like Melissa mentioned, we're seeing a lot of sleep issues and this is an app that helps part of that. Liberate Meditation is an app for Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, to ease anxiety, find gratitude, and also address internalized racism and microaggressions that are definitely um, very much in our forefront of vision for all of us right now. Um, so it's a celebration of Blackness, it's a celebration of, of both and resiliency um, for, for um, students. And UCLA Mindful app is to promote mindfulness anywhere, anytime. And Calm, um, which some of you may be familiar with, is an app that is wonderful for sleep and meditation and relaxation. 
So those are some apps that are in the public domain you can check out um, and, you know, refer those onward. Uh, thanks, Christina. And I'm going to tap in for a second. Um, so PFA is really for those, you know, when there is those adversities, um, as we were saying, not everyone in, from uh, at, with COVID is going to be impacted the same way. As some of you in, in the chat had talked about, we have some people that are going through significant hardships or economic hardships that are dealing with uh, racial discrimination that as our communities begin to open up, we're going to hear more about child abuse and domestic violence in the home. So we want to make sure that part of PFA is that making sure there's that information gathering and then adjusting our supports based on what's happening. But we also know that PFA is a, an acute intervention. It's a brief intervention. It, it's helping in those moments when these changes are happening. So any of you who have longstanding clients, you may have to do a PFA session if you know that there's been um, significant disruptions in checking in. How are they doing right now? And what kind of, uh, you know, in checking in with them before you go into your, your treatment uh, protocols. But for some of our folks, as we go into the, um, the summer and into the fall, we know that there are people that are going to need a more intermediate intervention. Um, so SPR was something that we created for the SAMHSA Crisis Counseling Program which is a program that you ha are, uh, that's being initiated in New York, including the surrounding states, to help with um, making sure that it's a community-based intervention program that does education, it does outreach, some of the PSAs that you'll be hearing or public service announcements will be ones that are funded by the Crisis Counseling Program. But it allows us to think about if somebody needs one time or only can meet with us one time, is there something that we can do to help them get unstuck or help them with their journey to recovery? So this can be done in a variety of settings. It does not have to be done, but uh, um, provided by a professional, though a licensed mental health professional should be connected to your work so that if somebody is needing a higher level of care, they can get it. So just like with psychological first aid, um, SPR, you can get the whole manual in all of our translations on our website. And we just launched in February a new course on SPR. So again, if you're wanting a free course to learn about SPR in a little bit more details, uh, you can get it here. Um, and so if you're looking at SPR, we're first dealing with the information gathering. What's happening with that person right now? Are they having some developmental disruptions or um, uh, are they vacillating over what their future would look like? They were supposed to go to college and now college doesn't look like it's going to give them the opportunities that they thought they had. They might not have the economic means to get to um, enroll in the school, so they need some um, help problem solving. Well, problem solving is one of the skills that we have in um, SPR. The pieces that Christina was just talking about, sometimes we need extra help with making sure we think about our own wellness or doing those things that give us that enjoyment in life. Um, those things of wellness and enjoyment help to improve our mood. And so positive activities is a, a core element or core skill in SPR. Um, managing reactions. We know that there could be reminders uh, to the losses that we're experiencing, the changes that we're experiencing, or just being triggered by the, all the different uh, changes that are happening. And sometimes we need help with managing the, those distressing reactions. How do we help to identify them so that I can potentially plan for a difficult day? So if I have had a, a loss, a death of a loved one, and I know their birthday is coming up, what is my coping strategy going to be around uh, supporting myself and my family uh, before the birthday, 
the day of the birthday, and we're going to need a little support right afterwards. Um, again, always thinking about how our social connections are changing. If I've lost my job and I've had to uh, move from a different apartment to a different neighborhood, I might have lost all my connections of my neighbors to that used to help me with childcare um, or gave me those additional supports and I might need help getting some of those uh, reboost of those connections. And the last thing with SPR is sometimes our thoughts just get in the way and sometimes our thoughts are just not helpful in, they might be accurate, but are they helping us move in the direction that we want to move in? So SPR is a skills building intervention um, that can nav help us navigate through some of these um, areas. Back at you, Christina. Yeah, and as always, um, it's so important for us to attend our own care. Um, we can't take care of others if we're not taking care of ourselves first um, and throughout our process of, of helping. Um, so when you think about your own care, if, if you think about it in terms of the triad of awareness, balance, and connection, so being aware of how you were reacting to this uncertainty and how you're um, understanding your reaction to stress, how you're managing it. Um, are you overworking? Are you overeating or forgetting to eat? I, I've had a colleague who is a psychiatrist who has been working um, very long days and she told me recently, like, I, I, I worked for like nine hours, I totally forgot to eat. And so when we're in our home environment, there's other things that are getting in our way and, and building our own awareness so that we can understand what's happening and how we can actually do things to help ourselves. And reminding ourselves too that we may actually need to talk to a professional if our stress or our life, our relationships um, gets to a point where we really need to kind of get more insight. Um, Balance, uh, find ways to take breaks during the workday um, as a, Psychotherapist, I know I'm often back to back with sessions and I found that I have to remind myself to drink water because drinking water also means you need to take bathroom breaks and you don't always have time to do that. So even shifting your mindset and building in break time, building in ways to nourish your body, um, hydrate your body during the day um, can be something we can overlook. Um, and reflect on our experiences. You know, this may be in the form of talking with colleagues or journaling or even doing some response art making that helps us just, you know, kind of unload the events of the day. And finding things that we do to help ourselves relax um, and have fun, laugh. You know, we do a lot of serious work and it's really important to find something to laugh about. Um, and you know, as we've been talking about eating, eating well, exercising regularly, but also getting enough of sleep and, um, you know, insomnia is affecting everyone in, in different ways on different days. But just recognizing that if we're getting adequate sleep, we can manage our mood, um, we can manage our day much more proactively. So sleep has to be a priority. And connection. How do we connect to one another? How do we connect to colleagues? and celebrate our successes. You know, when something goes well, let's take a moment to pause and celebrate it. Um, and finding ways to, to disconnect from work. When work is over, leave it behind, don't check that email, get off that computer, um, go be outside, go do something you enjoy. And, you know, thinking about um, our level of noise in our head, um, so our next slide is a wonderful little infographic that I want you to kind of hold in in your head. Are you being mindful where you're thinking of all of the events of the day that you're carrying with you as you go for that lovely walk? Or are you actually going for that lovely walk and seeing what's around you? So mindfulness is about allowing that space and creating that space to just be. So I think it's good. I think it's important for us to um, make sure that there are various resources and supports. So you'll see that there are general hotlines that are available. Um, 
So the suicide hotline is one. A subsidiary of that is the disaster distress hotline um, that get, uh, is activated 24-7. Uh, uh, Strong Hearts is for uh, our Native populations and Veterans Hotline is uh, for our, uh, created by our, our VA. So it's important to make sure that um, our clients have, or those that are reaching out to us, have various uh, connections for support. Um, our network has created different resources, and we're going to make sure that, they, um, that you get an, a copy of these. So um, we talked about how do we help parents and caregivers even talk about all the changes that are happening? How do we initiate the conversation, even with the conversations and the angst about um, everything's reopening? Um, what are those steps? Um, it has been important throughout this that kids should be kids still. And so how do we think about in integrating play and a diversity of play. So that play, um, we have different types of activities that can be done inside, for example, um, or off technology, or help to create uh, quietness or, or downtime. Um, we know that many of your clients or those that in your community have dealt with either separation because their family members are um, essential workers and they might not want to come home for a period of time um, or that there's been an illness and the family member has uh, stayed elsewhere or have had to go get hospitalized and we know that there's traumatic grief for those uh, whose loved ones um, have died and as Christina said because of the pandemic and some of the restrictions we have not been able to do those traditional mourning rituals that are so important. And so that resource goes into how do we support kids um, during this time when some of our usual uh, traditions aren't available. As one of you mentioned, uh, economic hardships is something that's so pronounced through so many of our communities. And so we took those five principles that I mentioned in the beginning about hope, safety, calming, self-efficacy, um, and uh, uh, safety and, and looked at how do we think about that um, from an economic hardship. So what are leadership, including leadership of our own institutions? How do we help um, support? So we have one for uh, community organizations, uh, one for parents, one for school aged, uh, high school or college age students and um, the last one is for educators. So those are uh, resources that you might uh, be interested in. And then Trinka and Sam is a children's book that um, I did help to create and it helps to uh, have this conversation with our little biddies. And so uh, the, uh, the coloring, the book is actually in black and white. So if you wanna print it out, they can actually color it as we're talking through it. But because Trinka and Sam and um, uh, it's a little bit different than a, a natural disaster because some of us have had different experiences with the pandemic and our kids have had different experiences. We have two parts to it. So our, our little mice here who are preschool mice have lots of questions and their questions are about um, if my uh, parent is an essential worker, why can't they come home every time? If my family member gets ill, how do I help to have that conversation? Um, for communities that have to have masks, why do I, uh, why are there, why does uh, going to the grocery store or going uh, uh, to the department store seem so strange right now? So Trink and Sam have been translated into uh, various languages and all the different languages um, are free. So uh, take a look and um, it's, a, it's a fun read if I, I do say so myself. Um, other resources that uh, if you're uh, part of any healthcare um, network, um, ASPR, which is the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, say that a few times fast. They uh, have a bunch of behavioral health resources from different federal agencies um, on COVID-19 behavioral health mitigation resources that you might want to take a look at. Our partners at the National Center for PTSD have a, several resources that are great for military and, and vets and 
other um, child uh, health health uh, service uh, resources, as well as our the Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress. Um, the Center for Pediatric Studies, um, they actually have some great tools for any kids who have pre-existing conditions or have been hospitalized, be not because of COVID, but have other illnesses and how do we support those folks. So with that, I know we're at our limit to open it up for some Q&A. So we're going to turn it back to you, Jim, and help uh, guide us to the next part. Yeah, well, thank you, Melissa and Christina, for a wonderful presentation. Um, folks, please keep your questions coming in, but we may just have time for a few here um, that have come through. Um, very quickly, uh, well, actually, this was an easy one, um, and I, I thought the same thing. Christina, when you were going through your segment about um, using the census for grounding, I think it was the 54321. I think someone was asking specifically if you can repeat the you know, five, four, three, two, one. Um, sure. Very, very great. Sure. So five things you see, four things you hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So I kind of just moved down the space. It helps us organize it. <laughs> I thought so. This question might be a little bit um, more difficult because I think it has to do with meeting people's basic needs, and I think you addressed this very critical issue. Um, I'm going to read one of the, well, actually, no, I, I'll try to summarize. So one of the questions had to do is, you know, when we give the message, we're all in this together, um, there was some questioning about that um, because oftentimes, yes, we're all into it. So if you can clarify this, but the, I think the, the gist of the question was oftentimes we give that message, but the reality is, is that many, there are many folks who are either uh, faced with greater burden regarding uh, COVID-19 in this disaster, um, as well as you know, again, may just be generally more vulnerable. So I just wanted to know if you could clarify that issue, because I think that message, um, I think the concern is that message uh, may not be true and may be difficult for, for folks to process. So I just wanted to mention that real quick. Um, and your thoughts? So I, I've heard different things. For, um, Christina mentioned we're all in the same storm, but different boats. Um, I've kind of stayed away from that a little bit and gone into, we might actually be in different storms. So some of us might be in a hurricane, the hurricane eye level, where some might be in the, the uh, farther away from um, the eye of the storm. But I think yeah, we're dealing with this pandemic, but this isn't, uh, um, we're not all impacted in the same way. So I am very careful of saying everyone that is traumatized by this. You have some you have some families that are coping quite well, but they're not having the same experiences. And I appreciate the the uh, person who said there are such significant economic hardships that some people have gotten their jobs back, many are not, or their or the businesses are, are folding, and they thought they were going to have their jobs, and then none. We know that the health disparities or the the uh, racial dis, uh, discrimination. Uh, is quite real. And so that's why we have to make sure that what is that, how do we do some of that information gathering and then tailor our interventions for the additional supports that, that people need, including if we end up finding out if there are, um, uh, if there's been any abuses in the home. Um, we, the hotlines have not showed an increase of child abuse, but if you talk to ER doctors, they're talking about those um, abuse cases that have come in, they've come in more frequently and more severely. And that's what happened after the economic uh, recession um, many years back. So we can anticipate that we're gonna have to be dealing with this. So we absolutely have to um, not treat this as a one size fits all. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I, I wish I had more time to flush out the metaphor. And I think the example, too, is the access to um, what what we have in our in our toolbox in terms of what, you know, when you think about the boat you're on, you might be on a luxury liner and you might be in a dinghy that has a hole and you're trying to bail it out just to stay afloat. <laughs> So, you know, the environment that we're all in is going to be so impacted by the way in which the storm, like Melissa said, I love the example of are you in the eye or are you in an outer ring, uh, but also the 
the adversities that you're you're facing and just trying to keep your home environment, you know, what does that look like? Um, yeah. And I think that key of, of connecting to our clients to really determine what that is has to be something, you know, it has to be the check-in point of what does that look like for you? Right. And I, and I think with that, too, I'm wondering if you have any, I know you've, you've talked about information gathering, and it sounds like that information gathering exists both obviously with your clients or the, pers the people you're working with, right? So how is this affecting you? But I'm also wondering, um, you know, some of the, the basic needs that may be um, at risk um, of, of folks, well, folks not being able to have their basic needs met. Um, have you thought, I, of course, that's always a difficulty for behavioral health providers in terms of trying to figure that out. Um, it involves collaboration, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts also about that. Like, what are some best practices around collaborating with community resources or working and identifying community resources that can help fill those needs that sometimes we're in a place to identify? I think there's a couple of strategies. When we talked about the efficacy, um, um, leaders need to hear your voices about what are some of the needs of our healthcare workers. And sometimes when they're at the higher level, they don't uh, truly understand the um, uh, some of the intricacies of why some of these. So I've talked, I've heard that food drives where there's these drive, you drive your car to get um, to get your basic needs. Uh, well, some communities are like, well, I don't have enough gas to actually put in my car, so you want me to hop in the car to either get tested or to um, or to um, get um, food for my family. So what other options were there? So then I heard communities take their school buses and start delivering the food to the family families versus us expecting them to come to us. So there's things that have to happen to, is what we're proposing working for all communities uh, in our community members or only some. And we have to obviously protect privacy, but at highlighting how some of these things have to be adjusted is things that our leaders and those that are, are creating some of these are. are um, and the second part of PFA is I don't, um, where do I get this information? So is there uh, local resources uh, that I should be aware of and uh, keep up? So is it my health department that's updating or is there a COVID-19 resource center or hub that some have uh, created to allow us to point to our, um, to those that we're serving where to get kind of some of these supports? Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. And actually, uh, you've given me something to think about for uh, future offerings, because I think that finding out and getting that information is something that we can do. Um, I think eh, I'll try to squeeze one more in here, um, which is, um, again, if you have some thoughts about the most vulnerable with behavioral health issues. So there's a couple of questions that came in about folks with obviously pre-existing uh, substance abuse issues who are backtracking or in many cases uh, relapsing, um, as well as teenagers who have um, uh, are experiencing, again, uh, stress and losses, hearing or seeing about deaths, racism, destruction. Um, so um, what are some ways to help teenagers um, address these issues as well? So I think there's a, a couple of things. Uh, we're trying to use social media, and uh, um, sometimes uh, youth will go to a famous actor or sports star before they will come to any of us. So can we use some of these platforms that have a larger audience to talk about, um, uh, educate, hey, why are they feeling this way and things they can do about it? One thing I heard from a lot of youth is that when we talk, we're talking about everything shutting down, they thought actually everything. And so some of our transitional age youth, our child welfare, Students, uh, kids in the child welfare system didn't know that hotline services or some of the services they depend on were actually still open. So we need to actually clarify what services they can get. Um, being get, getting familiar with 
TikTok and some of these others that we might not be as adults get used to, but they're they're all using these platforms. And how do we get how do we adapt our messages to their platforms versus again having them go to some of our archaic websites that they'll never go to? Great. Well, you know what? I'm aware of time. We're at time. So we'll need to stop here. There were many more questions that came in. A couple of things I want to mention to folks. First, we're going to have Melissa um, and hopefully Christina join us again to talk about psychological first aid specifically to meet the needs of children and, and, and youth returning to schools. So it's going to be um, talking about psychological first aid in schools. Uh, we hope to have her back for that and uh, talking specifically about those kinds of issues. Um, I want to thank Melissa and Christina for a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to apologize to many folks who had some difficulty um, logging in at the beginning, but I'm glad you joined us. Um, of course, as always, the recording of this webinar, as well as the slides and whatever resources we have, will be available on the CTAC website within the next couple of days. So you can look for that to see what you missed. Um, and um, and get whatever additional information we, we will have uploaded to the website um, with regards to resources and guides and information that Melissa and Christina shared. But once again, I want to thank you all on behalf of the CTAC for joining us and Melissa and Christina for a wonderful presentation. Thanks, everybody. Have thank a good you. Day. Have a good one.